My name is Greg Brown, as uh, Allison said, I'm one of the associate deans for the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, we were asked as members of uh, the leadership team for the Science Initiative to provide some lunchtime entertainment. I use that word loosely. Uh, to give you an update about this, the UW uh, Science Initiative. And joining me today are uh, a few members of the, the campus leadership team uh, who will be helping me with the presentation. Uh, Dr. David Williams, uh, head of the body department. Uh, Dr. Danny Dale, head of physics and astronomy. Uh, Dr. Mike, Mark Leifer, director of the UW Life Program. And uh, Dr. Professor Sylvie, uh, Cynthia Weinig, professor of botany. And before I go further, I would like to point out that we did bring some literature. We didn't want to clutter up the tables with these, but we have a table over here by the door that has both the copies of the Governor's Task Force report and then also the recent uh, UIO magazine uh, which features the Science Initiative. And both of these are rich sources of, of information uh, on the initiative. I'd like to add, before I turn this over to Dave, that um, in my 30 years at UW, uh, this has been, I think, the single largest interdisciplinary of faculty collaboration uh, that I've seen. And in fact, in the short amount of time since it was formulated a little over a year ago, I feel like we've made some really positive and deep progress uh, in this particular initiative. And I think you'll see that uh, today uh, in the slideshow. Um, Dave, uh, we'll start this off and we'll turn it over. Come on up, Dave. Uh, then we'll turn it over to uh, Mark and Danny and uh, some of our colleagues to, to do a piece on active learning uh, and then wrap it up with uh, Cynthia and myself. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, and thank you everyone for attending. I'm going to just kick this off and tell you a little bit of the history of the Science Initiative and start with some um, overview of kind of where our, we currently are with uh, the planning of the, of the project and then I'll turn it over to our other speakers. First, uh, this is gonna be a uh, learning actively exercise. Uh, you're gonna learn about the science initiative while you're actively eating and clanking your silverware together. We're used to this chaos uh, in the courses we teach, so we're perfectly fine with all this, but if you can't hear because of your neighbors clanking their dishes, just kind of shove them and tell them to pay attention, okay? Uh, let me go ahead and get started. This is the history of the project. Um, the, at the end of the uh, last biennium budget session, the state legislature added a note asking for the governor to appoint a task force of former alums and um, folks in the state that could then help us develop, the campus leadership team, help us develop a plan for the science initiative. The leadership team is described in the booklet that we presented to the governor last December. If you're interested in who those folks are, I would advise you to take a, take a copy home with you. But these are notable alums of the STEM fields from the University of Wyoming. Um, they really helped us uh, develop the, the core ideas of what you'll hear about today. They were particularly helpful in allowing us to understand the strong connection between basic science research, the applied sciences in the health, agricultural, engineering fields, and science education. And we feel that we are doing the best we can to integrate these components within the science initiative. And although the science initiative is focused on the uh, raising the level of scholarship and student success in a few key areas of core programs at the University of Wyoming, we feel that by doing this, we will have rippling effects across the campus as well as across the state. We'll hear some examples of that from our speakers. So um, the legislature um, provided us with some money to start this project. They set aside $30 million of our requested $100 million for the construction part of this project. The construction part deals with some facilities, a new building. You'll hear about some details of that here in a second. Importantly, um, in addition to the level two planning funding, importantly, the, the legislature provides funding for the start of some programmatic elements. And this is really key because we've seen all around in many different institutions that one can build buildings, 
but it really comes to life when we are engaging the activities within those buildings. And with it at the University of Arizona, the programmatic elements which require continuous funding are key to the success of building sciences to the top four top um, in the state. So the programmatic elements are key, and the programmatic elements helped us design the construction part of, the, of this project, the building project. And so form and function here are tightly linked. Okay? Uh, we're, the current request from the legislature in this next biennium is for uh, a ramp up of the programmatic components of the science initiative, and you'll hear about some details of what those programmatic elements are. Two of those are already begun with the initial $750,000 funding. And finally, the request for the remainder of the capital construction funds that will allow us to then build a, a facility that will be the home to these, these important programs. So these are some takeaway points, and we'll hear about these again from uh, Cynthia, I think, later in the talk. But the science initiative we feel is transformative, and it's transformative in several ways. It's transformative not, all, transformative not only to elevate core sciences and allow those core science programs to interact together in new ways on campus, but it's also, we think, transformative in that it is building a strong connection between the enterprise of doing basic research and science education, as well as changing the way we do science education. That's going to be very transformative. Danny and Mark will speak about the active learning programs that we're developing. Um, and in order to, to build um, these programs and up to top quartile, we have metrics for this that include PhD student production, uh, reducing the time to graduation in the STEM fields, um, higher levels of scholarship, bringing more talented faculty to campus. These are things that will elevate us to top quartile in the country. Um, Making sure that we have integrated programs and facilities is really key to, to what we're doing here. Finally, uh, Brian Shader added this last bullet. He's a mathematician, so he's got a nice operator, the equal sign in there, to just let us know that we should be thinking in terms of this kind of logic. Uh, the science initiative is success. What do we mean by success? This leads to our core philosophy for the science initiative. That's student success. Whenever we have discussions, sometimes heated within our leadership team about the trade-offs between different components of what we're trying to do, and there will be trade-offs because our funding is, is limited. We always go back to what is our core philosophy and what are we trying to do. We weigh every decision against how is this going to help our students succeed in the STEM fields, undergraduates and graduates. So that's, that's the core driving principle. And in order to do that, we feel that bringing talented faculty to the University of Wyoming in core research areas, core science areas, leads to better success of our students. We want our students to be engaged with the top research scholars in the country. We need to bring them here, we need to track them here, and in that way, our students are experiencing the research activities at a level that's equal to the top institutions in the country. And that's going to allow them to be competitive uh, in a very tight job market in the STEM fields. So that's really critical. Here are the four programmatic elements that we'll talk about. I'll talk about the first one, the Wyoming Research Scholars Program, and then Danny and Cynthia and, and Mark will tell you about the other programs. The Wyoming Research Scholar Program. This one is already launched with the, the starting uh, funding that we got from the legislature um, last year. Um, here, um, we're not replacing or duplicating undergraduate research experiences that already exist within the university and across the state, like Embre and EBSCOR. We're building something, I think, that is quite complementary, um, where we can uh, add some components to a student's experience that will complement um, the other research programs that already exist. So we understand that there are other research uh, undergraduate research programs in the state that are very successful. Um, we're going to bring some new things to that uh, dynamic and, and partner with those other research programs to build better experiences for students and expand it to more students um, that come to the University of Wyoming or that are at the community colleges that want to start their experience, research experience there. With full ramped up funding, 
we hope to be able to support 100 undergraduate researchers at the University of Wyoming. That, that's a lot, um, but we feel that this experience, this hands-on experience with carrying out science, applying the knowledge that was gained in their coursework to complex problems, learning the tools, and learning the soft and hard skills, and applying those soft and hard skills in a, in a rigorous research laboratory environment, is the best thing that we can do with, for our students. It's the best form of active learning uh, that a student can experience. And when you assess and you ask students what was the most important transformative thing that they experienced at the university, those that have engaged in a research project point to that as the, the top experience. Okay? Um, we, we feel that's important. We're gonna try to expand this to as many students as we have the capability. This is where we are with the Wyoming Research Scholars Program currently. Uh, we have initial funding to support 12 students. We've already recruited for five students um, since we were um, awarded the funding to start this fiscal year in, in July. We have 50 applicants that we're currently reviewing for 10 slots for the Wyoming Research Scholars Program for this coming academic year. And that should show you right there that there's a lot of demand for this program. So only 20% of the students who are applying will be able to, to bring the program this year. Hopefully with ramped up funding over the next several years, we'll be able to bring in many more. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Danny, who's gonna tell you about some of these other programs. Thank you. So uh, <clears throat> my colleagues and I are passionate about student success happening also in the classroom in addition to happening in the research lab. So active learning is one of our uh, main uh, focuses. And it's not just a buzz phrase, we're, uh, we're actively doing this in our classrooms. I'm just gonna give you a feel for what we mean by actively learning. Um, and here's some numbers just to, to, to back up before I even get into some of the examples. Uh, student retention is higher when you have students more actively engaged in the classroom. Uh, I believe my colleague Mark is gonna have a a slide showing passive learning. I think maybe that's an oxymoron, personally. Um, so anyway, active learning. I had a classroom uh, where I taught active learning physics last last year, and in a typical theater style, 100 student, big lecture setting, uh, my attendance was 70 some percent. I had 97 percent uh, last time when I taught that same class using active learning techniques. Student learning. Um, in my field, we, um, in physics pedagogy, we actually have a, an exam we give at the beginning of the semester, we give at the end of the semester, it's called a pre and post exam. You probably have the similar things in your fields. Um, when we say 45% learning gains, imagine a student walks into a, a classroom at the beginning of the semester and has a certain knowledge already walking in. Well, they take the exam at the end of the semester and they've done better. What is the, uh, the difference in how they've, uh, they, they, they've, they've improved their learning? Um, typically, a student will fill only 25% of their initial gap in physics. So it's kind of depressing when you think of that. When you do active learning, they fill about 45% of that gap. So we, we, we're spinning this as a factor of two improvement in learning. They're filling about half of that gap when they only typically would fill a quarter of that in a, in a passive setting. So a factor of two improvement in learning. Um, and students uh, are more likely to pass the class. The ABC rate is uh, about 50% higher than you get in a passive learning situation. And then I think of Bloom's taxonomy, students are not just uh, memorizing and, and uh, maybe doing a little bit of application, they're also evaluating, synthesizing, they're doing these higher order thinking when you uh, are more likely in an active learning setting. So what does it mean to be active learning? Uh, students are engaged in their own learning. Uh, I can give you some examples from, from my field in physics, uh, and we'll do an example like this later actually today at lunch. Um, clickers, so it's great to do uh, formative uh, feedback right during the classroom when you maybe have some content uh, presentation and the students get in small groups, maybe they'll do think, pair, share, or some kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, teaching and learning, and then you can immediately do a little quiz with a, uh, you could use hands, you could use flashcards, we used to have clickers that students had to buy and then register, now it's so easy, we just use cell phones, so uh, it's kind of fun to require students to bring cell phones to the class. <laughs> Um, uh, Case-based learning. Uh, I love, in, in Physics 1, I love to talk about Spider-Man. In Spider-Man's girlfriend, Gwen Stacy, she was dropped from a, uh, a tall building by the mean green goblin, and, and she was falling, and Spider-Man shot his web down, and he caught her right before she hit the pavement. 
and then in the, uh, the movie and in the comic book, she actually dies. And what we do, we treat this as a case scenario where we uh, get in small groups, we calculate the acceleration that she felt when she was stopped by the webbing, and you'll find out that the number of Gs she experienced was hard, higher than you would get from a, you know, a fighter pilot in a, in, a, in, a, in a steep maneuver, and that's why she died. So it's a fun, interesting way to do case learning. <laughs> And then uh, our last example, uh, we're doing studio physics here at UW where we uh, combine lecture lab and discussion all in the one setting so we can go back and forth between theory and experiment really easily and smoothly. Um, a good example of that in, in uh, inquiry-based learning, we tell them about Newton's laws and two-dimensional projectile motion and then we give them a challenge. We say, here's a projectile launcher and there's an X on the floor. Uh, you're not allowed to do any practice tests, you just need to do some measurements of the spring of the ball, um, how far away is the X on the floor, how far, above, how far above, uh, below the table is the floor. Apply the uh, theory that you've learned and then you get one shot um, in front of all your peers and whoever gets the uh, closest to the X you know, wins a small prize. So you have a, a hook, you get them challenged and then they're actively applying what they've learned you know, just a few minutes ago in the, in the theoretical aspect of the course. So these are examples of what you can do with active learning. You can also do this uh, in a large lecture setting, and that's what Mark will talk about. There's all kinds of ways to do this, and we're going to build some of this into new facilities with the Science Initiative. And I'll pass it off to Mark. Thank you. All right, doing? Falling asleep yet? Yeah? No, we're good. So Danny alluded to passive learning and active learning, you're right, he talks specifically about active learning, but can you see these images up here? If you were to say which of those, which of those spaces would be most suitable for a passive learning environment, which would you say would be upper left, lower right? I heard upper left, okay, excellent. Active learning, probably more successful in lower right, you guys are doing good. What spaces do we tend to have right now? Yeah, say it again. Uh, upper left. We got a lot of those that are great. What we're proposing as part of the science initiative is actually to develop spaces where we can really engage students in a very productive way. It's not that you get, can't do active learning in these large tiered lectures halls. You kind of run into a lot of barriers of what you can actually do, how we can engage students in very meaningful ways. So what we're proposing in the science initiative is actually to build four classrooms, believe it or not, a classroom of 200 students, 150 students, 100 students, and 50 students will carry all the courses in these core departments that are part of the, life, or part of the, uh, the science initiative. About 4,000 students would run through these four classrooms in the course of a semester. That's huge. Huge impact. What we argue and what we know is space matters, right? The space that you're in in terms of your teaching environment absolutely matters in terms of student engagement and student learning. Which of these spaces are we most accustomed to, most comfortable in? You don't fall asleep yet, still engage. Upper left, lower right. We're used to the upper left, right? That's what our faculty are used to, that's what we're into, we're used to. And so how do you tend to teach? You tend to teach the way, finish the sentence, you tend to teach the way you were taught, right? So we as faculty are often comfortable in that passive setting, not so much in the active setting. So in fact, the other critical piece of this, and this is that program part, the other critical piece for this is LAMP, we call Learning Actively Mentoring Program. Rather than just build these facilities and then throw faculty into them and assume they'll figure out how to teach effectively in this, what we want to do is bring in some experts, hire them into our departments that actually know how to do this, work with, work with the Elbow Good Center for Teaching and Learning here on campus to help mentor faculty so that they know how to engage students of the dozens of different ways, some of which Danny mentioned. How do we do that? How do we engage them in, 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 uh, in learning? So we'll have faculty being mentored, we'll have graduate students being mentored, we'll have undergraduates being mentored. So imagine trying to facilitate an active learning environment in this classroom, can one person do it? Effectively. <laughs> Better with multiple, right? So it takes lots, of, lots more people. So we hope to engage undergrads to help facilitate these things. We've actually got a first cohort started going on some of these things. And one of the really cool things we're gonna do is reaching out into the state is bring in K-12, educators, 
community college faculty, UW faculty, bring them together to start thinking about how can we do this more on whole scale and get students actually used to this as they come to our institution. So we've got a K-16 Science Summit that's going to be running on the 20th of February this coming year, 2016. If you look in front of you, you may have a colored sheet. How many of you have a colored sheet in front of you? Would you grab that and hold it up high? Well, well done. Um, how many of you have a sheet other than glue? Keep holding those up. Yeah, come on. Don't put them down. Keep holding them up. Oh, I see. Who has yellow? I got one, two, three. Where's another yellow? And who's got green? That lime green. Hold those up high. How are you guys feeling? The fajitas treat you well? Or you a little queasy? Maybe a little bit warm? Getting the cold shivers like. I hate to tell you, you may be diseased, those of you who don't have the blue ones. And um, I'm not a, a, a medical person, I'm, I'm not a microbiologist, but fortunately we have a microbiologist on hand who's going to help us out to, to treat you guys. So Mark, you doing okay with that? Okay, Mark's feeling okay, but not for long, I'll, I'll guarantee it. So what we're going to do is I'm going to have uh, Rachel Watson, who is a microbiologist, who understands these pathogens, and all, also I'd say probably one of the top teachers here at UW, Kind of help you guys uh, work through an activity here. So, Rachel, come on. I am so honored to be here today because I know better than perhaps many how much good educating goes on at community colleges. So much of your focus, I had the honor to attend the uh, Roadmap to STEM conference up in Sheridan this year, and I was just blown away by the quality of education. So I hope, I, I want you to know that I respect you more than I can possibly ever say. Um, that being said, um, I am also extremely passionate uh, in both teaching and learning, and I chose a photo that I reminded me of one of my prior students, his name is Mike, and he actually currently now is an engineer in Sinclair, but the picture on the lower left really reminded me of him because he grew up in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and when he was young, he uh, had a, a bit of a, um, an interruption in what was a common game that he would play, and what students would do is that they would come up to one another and they would say, beta B, and then they would say, ta, and they would give high five, right, and then high five. But when the Ebola outbreak in 1995 in Kikwok happened, he no longer would be able to touch the other person that he was trying to high five. And so they would instead come up to one another, say, beta B, and then stop Ebola, right? And then he said to me one day, he said, Rachel, it was pretty scary. I was like, yeah, of course it was pretty scary. But you know what I think so often, a lot of our fear uh, of pathogens comes from the fact that we don't understand how contagious they are, and we don't understand how their, what their route of transmission is. And so that's a, a little bit of this exercise will help us understand today. So those of you who had those colored cards, uh, you were given some additional colored cards representing how contagious you really are. So who has a yellow card? All right, you are Ebola. You have been infected with Ebola, and you need to go, and you need to infect, and I noticed that their LCCC was all together, Casper College was all together. Get out, infect people from other colleges, right? Um, so get out and infect, but now, who has that bright green? All right, excellent. Bright green, you're infected with measles. Guess what? You get to go infect 18 other people. So each one of you four with measles, you gotta get going. You've got a lot of 
And uh, we need to see how many people have now been like yellow cards. So we'll hold it up those yellow cards. Okay? So we should have two, four, six, eight new people now infected with Ebola. Okay? And so we had started with four. Now how about measles? Oh no, you're infected with both. Okay. <laughs> Symptoms are shown. So it's much less contagious. 
Does anything surprise you at all in looking at the, the various are not values on here? I think it's informative just to look at where we see things like HIV sitting. And I thought just a really quick um, note on looking at Ebola versus HIV. Now, after you sent in that poll, who got a text message back? Yeah? I noticed some of you were already dorking out on the website. So if you hit that website, go to that website, and it's going to give you a little bit more information about Ebola. And what I want you to tell me is to scan down on that webpage and tell me how many cases total were there of Ebola in the most recent outbreak in West Africa. Anybody find it? Kind of scanning all the way down, there's a graph at the bottom. Peter, I can see you. You got it, right? Total number of cases? Oh, um, you know, it's the honesty is the best policy. <laughs> 28,331. And the number of fatalities was 11,310. So what is about the mortality rate? It's high. It is, but maybe unexpectedly lower than you would think. Most textbooks say about 80%. But if we do some quick math there, and I should, where's Brian Chater? I should make him do the math. Um, it's, it's roughly 40%. Um, and of course, that's partly due to interventive strategies that have been used. So I just wanted to briefly compare the death rate for Ebola to that of HIV. Um, HIV, I should say, AIDS-related deaths. Um, and that's about 1,500,000 in 2013 alone. And since the start of the epidemic, 39 million. So it's interesting, and I'm, I'm going to leave you because I need to go. But I want to plant a seed for more sexy-minded conversation at your tables about why then is Ebola so scary. microbes at this point, but that was a fantastic example of the kind of active learning strategies that can be adopted. I'm going to touch on two additional programs, and as Dave touched on or elaborated at the beginning, really as the leadership team discussed any program, we really kept the student experience foremost in mind. The two programs I'm going to talk about bear both on the research enterprise at the university, but also teaching as it's related to research. So one of these is the PhD fellowship program. As we engage in research, we know that PhDs, the students in our labs, graduate students in our labs, make a significant contribution. They undertake a lot of the direct research, they come up with innovative ideas, they mesh their novel interest with ongoing research in the lab, they're critical contributors. They also contribute to the teaching mission of the university, serving in classroom settings, also with mentoring, and often they'll begin to undertake novel um, work with other, with other labs or novel teaching components. Under the fellowship program that's proposed under the SI, they'll also take part in the LAMP program. So hopefully we're going to end up with more educators who give dynamic and fantastic active learning guided lectures like what Rachel just gave. So this is part of the program, the PhD fellowship program, also the competitive research or um, Competitive Research Innovation Program, or CRIP. So this part of the, this programmatic element is designed to increase faculty startup packages in part to recruit the best possible faculty to UW. As Dave said, we want the best researchers here because these people then um, are most uh, informed in terms of novel research and can guide uh, ongoing work with students at the university as well. In addition, there's small um, research grants for to go in innovative and novel directions. So for instance, if you're in one track as a researcher, you may want to branch off, but it's very difficult these days to get external funding, as I think many of you are aware. The research success at NSF, DOD, NIH is pretty low, and so it's critical to have preliminary monies. And I'll illustrate part of the success of the CRIP program using some of the plans that brought today. Um, in addition, the CRIP program should be funding staff within some of the centers that I'll also discuss in a minute. 
And these are important to guiding um, undergraduate and graduate research that will be ongoing and also participating in faculty research. So I wanted to also relate these programmatic elements, all of the ones that we've heard about, to the building philosophy. The building philosophy is centered around the idea that where it should be where science meets science education. So the building is developed with integration of teaching and research lab spaces, active learning classrooms, and facilities that allow students to really engage and be involved in and witness the research enterprise. So the building design is shown there, the second one in the middle on the right. And above that is the top floor, one of my personal favorites is the plant biologist. It houses the greenhouse and growth chamber rooms. In addition, within this building will be the Center for Integrated Biological Research. So this is the merger of the botany and what the biology programs, hoping, hopefully allowing for more integrative, dynamic research to occur between the departments and other STEM groups. The Center for Advanced Scientific Imaging, so um, imaging-based research. Um, that will span from atomic level up to whole plant or organismal level. Sorry, that was a, wasn't a whole plant, whole organismal level studies, active learning classrooms, collision spaces for active research, where students as well as students with faculty will interact, modern greenhouse growth chamber and vivarium facilities. So I wanted to illustrate part of this integration of programmatic elements in the building using some plants that I brought. So, I brought several plants that occur regionally, and they're important for various reasons. This is Brassica rapa, it's the field mustard. It's cultivated as um, cabbage, oil seed, and root crops. It's cultivated globally, it's important. It's cultivated also in the West. These two plants, these are members, these are the are Drummond's rockweed, and they're called, they grow in the wild. They contribute to the ecosystems that we see here throughout the West as primary producers, so critical to ecosystems we see around us. And this one has looked better. I had to get it out of the freezer before I came over because when I went looking for a weed, I couldn't find any. You know, when you go out to your backyard, you're looking for a dandelion, you don't find any. This is a common weed in the area, and it's problematic. It's also a member of the same family. So all of these plants are related, they're all in the mustard family. But the point here is that this illustrates a range of research that could be ongoing within the University of Wyoming. From crops to native species we value because they contribute to the aesthetic experience here and the wildlife and the ecosystems we see, to something that's problematic. Interestingly enough, as a point of, point of fact, the genomes of all of these organisms have been sequenced. Eight or 10 years ago, actually it's a bit longer than that now, the Human Genome Project was undertaken. And in addition to the human genome, several others were sequenced. It cost a billion dollars. Nowadays, the cost to sequence the genome of this organism is a couple thousand. So the point here is that the span of studies could be anything for students from whole plants, physiology, metabolism, genetics, to questions that range from cultivation, <coughs> crops, wild species, invasive. And I mention this because on that top floor, there are integrated research bays, teaching bays, growth chamber facilities. There's a staff, a staff member associated with this to facilitate the students moving seamlessly from teaching and research. I also wanted to point out, just in terms of all of the programs, this plant, again, Brassica rapa, mustard, might feature in my genetics lecture. My genetics lecture can be informed and improved through LAMP. My plant's dripping. I hope that doesn't matter on this floor. <laughs> my, my ongoing teaching, the work that I do in the classroom can be improved through LAMP. It's supported by the active learning classrooms as well, in terms of a physical establishment and a facility. It's supported by the greenhouse teaching research phase. People can move seamlessly through these facilities. It also relates to the Winding Research Scholars Program, because now students have this span of research that they can perform in my labs and others. I'm using an example of plants, but ongoing research through the vivarium or through CASI or other STEM disciplines supported under the SI could be equally broad and offer students a range of different opportunities, conceptually speaking, and just also in terms of nuts and bolts. This also bears on the PhD program because we'd be integrating PhD students into our work. And finally, on CRIP. I received, I'm using my lab as an example, but it's just representative. Anybody could do this. 
a $50,000 grant to do work on the microbes that are in the soil. There are billions of cells in the soil. You see the plant, you don't really see the microbes, but they're performing a lot of services. And this translated into a $7 million NSF grant. It was a totally new direction for me. I had not worked on microbes at all before. So I think that we can see through this illustration using plants that um, this, conceptually the buildings and the programs are very linked. If you have any questions about the plants, see me afterwards. Okay, so what are the metrics for the SI? Increased by 100% the number of undergraduates involved in high quality research. As Dave said, many students identify research interaction with a mentor as their most important uh, memorable experience in college. Obviously, it's also identified by, by future employers and their students. It's important for their employees to have hands-on prior experience. Improved quality of UW undergraduate education. We see that with LAMP. Hopefully, that will contribute to excellence, improved uh, or excellence in teaching. Also, the Wyoming Research Scholars Program and Active Learning Classroom. Increase the five-year graduation rates for core science majors by 100%. I was surprised to learn how far below uh, some of our comparators, our current graduation rates are in five years. So really, as we heard from Danny, the mechanisms we're using should improve that. Increase the number of PhD graduates by 25%. We currently host about 200 as um, counted in a recent survey among the staff departments that are discussed here. 25% increase in peer-reviewed publications. I was happily surprised to hear that we put out about 1,200 peer-reviewed applications annually, but of course that raises the profile and points of the university to have more uh, publications. 25% increase in grant and contractual funding. Again, in the same um, survey here, we found that about 22 million was brought in annually in external grants and funding, but programs like CRIP will increase the competitiveness for this. And ultimately, the aim is to have top quartile status in publication rights, PhD students, full-time equivalent faculty. So going back to Dave's starting point, the SI is transformative. We'll have integration um, in, across disciplines in novel ways. Integration of science and education is the most core and critical component. And again, the science initiative equals success. I view this as a success on one level for the university, and there should be many other opportunities in the future. I think Greg's gonna give us a summary. Thank you. Uh, just one observation about the active learning exercise. Uh, I have observed based on a sample of one that our students are a lot more snappy and quick with their cell phones than our faculty and administrators. <laughs> What I'd like to leave you with is, is this slide, which is the goal for UW T-shaped STEM graduates. Uh, and I think this is a, a place uh, where the science initiative uh, uh, dovetails very, very nicely with what we're trying to also do with the engineering initiative on campus. And I suspect the, the upcoming uh, education initiative as well. Uh, uh, and I'm going to go back to something Dave pointed out. The, the single most important goal that we filter all our decisions uh, in the science initiative through is our student success. And that we see here again in this uh, T-shaped STEM grad uh, from the University of Wyoming. With that, I'd like to remind you that we have uh, plenty of uh, literature on the, the side table here. You're welcome to take that. Uh, it has a lot more details about everything you've heard uh, today, except for the Ebola stuff, it's not in there. Um, and uh, I'm not sure about the time, Allison. We have, I guess, some time for a few questions if there are any. I'm gonna ask you one for way back today, thing that says that you need college students to be eligible for the apply Right. We have, um, <coughs> excuse me, we will, uh, starting for the competition for uh, fall of 2016, we will have seats or uh, places available for community college transfer students at UW and the Wyoming Research Scholars Program, uh, which uh, when I uh, found out last week that for a long time we were limping along with about 10 applications and I was getting worried. And it's like faculty, they all wait to the last minute to submit their grant proposal. <laughs> but we got pretty much 40 in one day, and 
I look at the quality of these, I was just blown away. So there really is this, this interest and demand uh, that students have once they find out what uh, they can even do research, legitimate research at the university. Uh, so that's there. So we are going to have uh, seats available or positions available in that program for transfer students from all of the community colleges uh, in the state. Uh, also, once we get the LAMP program, the Learning Actually Mentoring program, uh, th those will be programs that will be available for community college faculty uh, as well. So that's going to be a statewide uh, venture. And I should add, even what uh, Cynthia was saying, I said about CRIP, the, there's this innovative uh, C grant program. If there's a community college faculty member that's paired with a UW faculty member, they can be part of uh, that uh, as well. Well, thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of your conference. And uh, I'll, uh, I, my, my team, they have to go back and do research and teach. I'm just an administrator, so I'll hang out here for a while <laughs> and be willing to answer questions, uh, pass out uh, any of this literature. So thank you very much.